that. Oh, it shouldn't touch it, it will. Maybe it's best just to leave well enough alone to go to the next one. <coughs> There's your men's house, the porch of it on the outside. I wanted you to have a look at that. I beg your pardon? I said okay. Totally informal. Uh, the, 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 the main character isn't around, and everybody's just taking their ease and just sitting around. And since it's a nice day, they're under the, the, the grape barber and not inside. These characters here, they're all pretty much equal. That's why they're completely at their ease. Yeah, obviously, with this guy, who's certainly not going to do what, uh, remember what Colonel Brighton does last night in the movie? Did you see, did you see remember in, in King Faisal's tent? He can't, he can't keep his legs together, so he's sticking them right out in front of everybody. Faisal is too polite to say anything. All these little details. <laughs> Next. That, I think uh, Azim will recognize what I'm talking about. Those of us who were privileged to know this country before 1978 were struck by, it sounds trite and corny to say so, but how happy it was. People seem to be laughing and joking and singing songs all the time. This is an expression, and this is an atmosphere that you just don't get anymore. Next. Uh, this was the one craftsman in the village. Uh, I was very interested in Jawand Bazar where I was here. This is in Baudry's province. To note how even though women continued their crafts, before the Soviet invasion, male crafts had almost completely collapsed. Even in an area as remote as this, you would have one craftsman, one male craftsman, for the entire community. And this man is sort of you know, using scrap iron, and he can make anything. He repairs a teapot. He can make horseshoes. He fixes shoes. He's just general, all-around repairman. What, what the craftsman very much so, very much so. Sandal makers, <coughs> carpenters, all these people. Exactly. Is that why, is that why the men just abandoned the profession? Pretty much, but it's also because you have the import of uh, industrial, cheap industrial goods. Even in countries like this, between 1965 and 1978, when the first modern roads were built, you had an inrush of hand-me-down. Uh, used U.S. military clothing, old shoes, French Duralex drinking glasses. I remember when I was very, very young in Afghanistan in the early 1960s, you could still have leather sandals or leather uh, slippers with an upturned toe by Zorho. They were still made in the villages. The entire leather making industry collapsed. And by 1978, people were wearing well, certainly, as he's already wearing in 1970, plastic shoes. Typical. This kind of thing, of course, reached Joan Bazaar by donkey caravan. But nevertheless, Juralex glasses and not traditional pottery is what people were drinking out of. And this kind of plastic shoe, as opposed to traditional leather sandals, is what people were already wearing. So you can see something that looks as though it's out of the 15th century, but already you have these inroads happening. What the women make, make, of course, endures no possible competition. When a woman stitches a beautiful embroidered tunic or makes a wonderful carpet, no industrial product can, rivalize, can, can, can come into rivalry with that. That was a gallicism, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, the menfolk, of course, are selling these products of their wives for a pittance can, given the labor-intensive work in, involved in this kind of thing. But it holds out in the market. So what you get from Afghanistan today will almost wholly be what women make, not what men make. Next. Now oh, there's the craftsman again. Next. There he, yeah, there he's making the horseshoes, as you can see. Next. Okay, on the trail again, we're actually going to be finding a whole line of 12th century forts connecting 
the two sites we were looking for, but it's to give you an idea of the terrain, how impossible this is to conquer. Next. Okay, I suppose if you weren't told that this was Afghanistan, you would suppose this was in Arizona? I'm sorry? It looks a lot like Turkey. Like Turkey too, right. What you've got here along the bottom is mulberries. There was a good silk industry in the 15th century, and mulberries are a staple uh, in the, uh, during the Soviet occupation of the country. The Mujahideen could go for days simply on water or tea and a bag of dried mulberries. Or you can also make a cake out of mulberries, which I think is called talcon. You know this, Azim? You ever had that? Yeah. yeah. People just live on mulberries. Next. This is exactly what you get in Hazara country, and you have it also in the back country of Herat, these wonderful lakes from the last glacial period in the mountains. Next. More canyon country. Next. Lake again. Next. That's the way we have to travel. It's almost impossible to move <laughs> along the cliff faces, so you just hug the riverbed and move through this. Next. This is one of the 12th century forts. We just found a whole line along this pathway, and we were able to figure out the extent of the 12th century kingdom in the Afghan highlands. Next. Ah, you want a lord? Here's a lord. A lord in all his glory, as he would have looked in the colorful age before 1978. Tajik lord, known as an Arbab, with his son, retainers. This is the chief mullah. This is the lord himself. Next. Another view of these people. Next. The mullah. Next. Mirza al-Layar in all his glory. The height of fashion in 1970 was to wrap your pistol in a beautiful red handkerchief and allow the ends of the handkerchief to hang out from the holster flap. See? That's the way you wore your gun. Not around the side, across. Next. Another one of those 12th century watchtowers. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did you notice that beautiful striped coat? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now this one, the chapan. Typical of the northern half of the country. They don't wear it in the south. They wear a shawl instead. Next. Silk. In his case. Uh, how old is the custom of wearing a striped coat? That, at the very, very least, uh, Joseph and his brethren. Most of these things were made in, um, in or around the town of Mazar-i Sh Mazar Sharif in northern Afghanistan, and it's women only. Are you okay with the machine? Yeah, no, I just want to film it. I mean, I'm not... yeah, I'll get a, I'll burn a DVD. Okay. Want another one? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. There's the Uri Tower. This was the other site. This is the famous minaret of Jam. You know, 12th century, all is all that's left of what we figured out was the summer capital of the Borid Sultans. And this is the model, you know, for the Kutub Minar in Delhi, if you ever get to see it. So fortunately, this is still standing, but the river is eating away at its base, you see. And we understand now that this 12th century marvel is holding together practically like 10 cents coins stacked one on top of another. And if the river <coughs> keeps on eating away at it, the whole thing is going to collapse. And uh, my archaeologist friend, um, Andrea Bruno, Italian, who's been working with UNESCO to try to save this tower, now can no longer go to the area because it's considered absolutely unsafe and inaccessible. And if so, then these photographs will be the record of the 12th century Sultanate of Gore, which founded the Sultanate of Delhi. So the archaeological wreckage is appalling. In many ways, 